know how some moments seem to stick to your memory better than others? Your first kiss, the birth of your children. Maybe you remember where you were when you heard about 9-11 or what you got for Christmas, say in 1988. You don't? Well, I know I do. I was nine years old and my brother and I had just opened all our gifts and we were happy, thankful, but still a tad disappointed because we didn't get the thing we had wished for the most. There was one present left under the Christmas tree, but our mom had told us that it was a toolbox that our dad had wanted for quite some time. So when he started opening it, we weren't really paying attention. After all, why would we? Seeing a boring toolbox being unwrapped, it's hardly the most exciting thing to do for a six and a nine-year-old who just got a bunch of new toys to play with. But all of a sudden, we heard our dad say, what's this? And we looked around and we saw him holding a brand new Commodore 64. We got our first computer after all, so our wish did come true. And since that day, I've been the designated tech support in our family. Not because of my amazing skills at playing Guiana Sisters, but because in contrast to the rest of the family, I was intrigued by the technology from the start. Learning how to use it, getting to grips with how it worked, and also figuring out what was wrong when it didn't. And for some very strange reason, I also seem to love reading the manuals. And a couple of years later, we got our first family PC. And some years later, my high school got its first internet-connected computer. And the lines of students wanting to experience the wonders of Alta Vista. They were long. A couple of years later, I found myself enrolled at a computer science department. And meeting my fellow students for the first time, I actually thought I would be the only girl there. But luckily, there were two of us, me, and my friend-to-be, Sarah. But other than that, the crowd around us definitely lived up to the general image of what a computer scientist should look like, according to a 2015 Google study. They were all, more or less, white men with glasses. And I found it incredibly troubling that a field with such a huge impact on all of our lives and of all of our society, and with such endless opportunities, didn't seem more inviting nor interesting to a broader and more diverse population. So there and then, the first seed was planted for what would later become both my passion and my job. Fast forward to today, the digital revolution changes everything, much like the industrial ones have done before, except for the pace now being much faster. Our world is more connected than ever, and the boundaries between the physical and the digital fade. Those of you who ever got around to play with the Commodore 64, you probably remember the hassle involved and the patience needed when wanting to play a, a simple game. It was nothing like today when we have the internet in our pockets and we can access the online world in just a second. So we've gone from a situation where we had to make an active, a conscious choice to use technology to a situation where we have to make an active and conscious choice not to use it. We communicate, we consume, we learn, we do business, we engage in debates and share experiences online. The challenges we face get increasingly complex and interdisciplinary, and machines can help us solve them. And we can use computers for what they're good at, while using our own imagination, creativity and ideas in order to come up with beautiful and exciting solutions to the challenges ahead of us. And while creating things in the traditional industries is out of reach to many of us due to high investment costs or the need for large machine parks. The only thing you need to create something new in the digital world is an idea and a device to implement that idea on. And while the physical world has constraints, the virtual world has no limitations. So if you can imagine it, you can actually go ahead and build it. And even the smallest innovation can disrupt an entire field. So that small idea that you have nagging in the back of your head, what if that could be the beginning of something truly big? But with all these opportunities also comes great responsibility. As we are faced with new questions related to privacy, ethics and safety. Each click, like and message leaves a digital trace that can be used to construct an image of who we are, what we like and what we are interested in. Algorithms form our search results, our news feeds, in order to better match what we are expected to like 
And so our worldview is shaped by what we click, who we follow, and who we interact with. Anyone can create content, trustworthy or fake, and spread it across the globe in a single click. And the Internet of Things brings together billions of smart devices, collecting and generating enormous amounts of data about us and our surroundings. And the fast-paced development within AI and robotics produces results that we thought of as science fiction only a few years ago. So the evidence of dramatic change is all around us. IT is no longer only a specialized field for a selected few, as it affects us as individuals and as a society. A society that's increasingly built from code rather than from concrete or wood. But still many questions related to technology are seen as the responsibility and interest of a small group of people. But can we really hand over the decision power on questions that concern all of us to a selected few? And do we really believe that the systems and tools and services designed and developed by the white men in glasses reflect the needs and ideas of our global and diverse population? Shouldn't we all be involved if we want to build kindness, humanity and empathy in a society that's increasingly formed by technology? Now, I think we should. But still, the common view of what the digitalization means for the general public is very much focused on the using aspect. Learning how to use computers, using software, using internet services. And of course, these are crucial aspects, in particular for half the world's population who's still not online. But still, merely knowing how to use technology is not enough. So throughout our lives, we built an extensive experience bank, knowledge bank, that helps us cope with situations we face in our physical world. So we know what we should do if we stand on a high cliff and look down into the water. So we know what to do before we jump in. And we know why we shouldn't place our hand on a hot stove. And we know how to go about trying to get out of the forest if we end up getting lost. But do you have that same kind of certainty when it comes to questions in the digital world? Can you easily know what links to trust? How to spot fake news? Whether to vote for or against a new surveillance law? What data are you willing to share? With whom? For what purposes? And to what extent are you willing to give up on your privacy in exchange for personalized and very convenient services? And have you ever thought about what kind of tasks you would feel comfortable delegating to a robot? How many of us and how many of our decision makers can make informed and well-grounded decisions on questions like these? We have nothing to fall back on. It's uncharted territory. As a result, countries all over the world are rewriting their curricula, adding computer science, computing or digital competence in order to better prepare girls and boys in becoming responsible users, aware decision makers and active creators in the digital world. And I think that's absolutely great, because kids and youth, they are our future fathers and mothers, decision makers, innovators, workers and citizens. And I hope that my kids will learn to be just as sure about whether to share their data with someone or whether or not to trust the internet service, as they are about whether or not to jump off that cliff. That producing things in the digital world will be just as natural to them as creating stuff with Lego. And I hope that they'll learn to tell right from wrong and to speak up in the digital world, just as they do when they play outside with their friends. But what about everyone else, all of us, who form our society today, tomorrow, and in the foreseeable future? All of us who make decisions now that will affect the world that our kids and youth will take over. All of us, regardless of gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic class, has the right, but also the obligation, to know enough in order to make informed decisions and be aware of the opportunities and the challenges that the digitalization brings. 
The European Commission has launched, launched the DIGCOMP framework, introducing five competence areas and 21 competencies, covering a range of issues such as digital identity, digital production, or problem solving. And they believe that all of these competencies are needed in order to, as they call it, swim in the digital ocean. And of course, we don't all need to become world championship swimmers. But we all need to know enough in order to stay afloat. So my question is, how can we help everyone do that? And this is the question that has driven me for nearly 20 years, since that day I met my fellow students for the first time. And it has brought me to the situation where I am today. My mission is to raise awareness in the digital world by helping people become included, feel involved, and be empowered. And I've had the pleasure of working with kids and youth families across generations, teachers, persons in management positions, and organizations ranging from schools and libraries to universities and startups. And I've done this as a fellow citizen, as a parent, as a researcher, as an entrepreneur, and now most recently by founding a nonprofit organization where we want to build a grassroots movement around digital competence for all with libraries throughout our country. I've seen mothers create interactive cards, blinking cards, with their children. I've seen kids discussing and creating fake news with their grandparents. And I've seen adults having the time of their lives trying to come get about programming a robot. And I've seen how eager elderly men and women can be about getting to learn about something that they th most likely thought they would never get to see. So last year, we organized a 3D printing workshop at our local library, and it had the largest age span to date. The youngest participant, she was four months old. Well, she came with her parent. And the oldest trio, two ladies and a gentleman, were probably around 80. And this gentleman came up to me prior to the workshop and said, I'm not really sure if I'm going into this 3D printing stuff, but I want to keep up to date with what goes on in the world. Now, this moved me deeply. And I couldn't help but wonder what went through the mind of this man as he sat there taking notes while watching a blue Eiffel Tower being printed by a small machine in 15 minutes. What he had seen throughout his lifetime, born into a country recovering from war, yet still wanting to learn, to understand, and feel included. So I strongly believe that the digital age can only live up to its full potential if everyone is put into a position to meaningfully participate. Age shouldn't be an issue, and neither should gender, ethnicity, or socioeconomic class. And of course, inclusion, diversity, they are ideals. They are wonderful ideals. And as such, they are unfortunately also difficult to achieve. But I think that these are ideals that we need to strive for, together, because it won't happen on its own. So that said, I want to leave you with one question. What can you do? Maybe you have special insight into something. Maybe you work at a tech company. Maybe you're a lawyer. Maybe you're a researcher or a business person or just interested in these topics. Why not share that insight with others? Arrange a workshop on fake news or a programming event for families or a discussion night about net neutrality at your library. Do you have kids around you? Engage in what they do online. What games they play, who they talk to, and how they talk to each other. Fantasize about technology with them. What kind of apps would you like to have if you could choose anything? If you could control your bed, your hat, or your bike using an app over the internet, what would you like it to do? And all of these big problems that we hear about on the news, how would you go about solving them? And try not to be that boring adult who goes, I'm not really sure if that's doable. But let the kid imagine. Let yourself imagine. Remember, there are no limits, and there are no right and wrong answers. And what about yourself? Are you also the designated tech support for someone? Good, because you're helping someone take that next step into the digital ocean. And what about yourself? 21 competencies. Look them up and see if you also, just like I did, find something that you could learn more about. 
So the world has changed dramatically since I was a kid and I played on my Commodore 64. My kids have had access to tablets and the internet since they were babies. And this spring, my seven-year-old daughter came home from school proudly announcing that she had programmed that day. And the digital revolution can be the source of great empowerment and endless opportunities, but it can also lead to a broad and deep divide. And it's my hope that we could find ways to include everyone in one way or another. And Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum calls upon all of us to shape a future, empowering people, placing people first, and constantly reminding ourselves that all of these new technologies are first and foremost tools made by people for people. And we're all responsible in guiding this evolution. And it's a responsibility that I think that we cannot and should not outsource. Because today, technology took a major role in forming our society. I believe it became everybody's business. Thank you.